today you can live at home in the fellowship of the Father, whatever's going on in your life. As you and I learn the secret of the easy yoke of Jesus, how to effortlessly do what he would do if he were in our places. And we do this by doing one thing, by arranging our lives around those activities that Jesus himself practiced to be constantly at home with and receiving power from his Father. And today I want to talk about what I think is the most awesome and mysterious and powerful of the practices, and that is the practice of sacrifice. What is it? Dallas writes, In the discipline of sacrifice, we abstain from the possession or enjoyment of what is necessary for our living, not as in frugality from what is really to some degree superfluous anyhow. So this one is costly. The discipline of sacrifice is one in which we forsake the security of meeting our needs with what is in our hands. And I throw myself upon God. It is total abandonment to God, a stepping out into the darkened abyss in the faith and hope that God will bear us up. A couple of examples from Scripture. One is Abraham with Isaac, where he's going to sacrifice Isaac and yet trust that God is somehow going to give him Isaac back. And of course, God does. Or then a very famous story in the New Testament where Jesus is looking at people at the temple and they're giving. And there's a little obscure widow who puts in two mites, uh, two tiny little coins, and it's all she got. And he says to his disciples, do you see her? She's given more than everybody else here. Because he's talking about spiritual reality and she is depending on God. And her intention is real. Her generosity is just as real as her money. She gave more. I know of a widow like that who has very little and her generosity is extraordinary. And God cares for her. So because this one is so unique, it is so central to the Christian faith, the cross, the ultimate sacrifice is at the core of who we are. I thought that uh, for today, I'm not going to do tips. I'm not. God will lead you in this one. I want to read for you a story. And uh, it's about what's called Babette's Feast. This was a summary of it from Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace. It is the story of a strict, austere, joyless religious sect in the far north of Europe, led by a very strict old pastor who has two young, lovely, radiant daughters who feel unable to plunge into lives of joy because of their sense of obligation to their father and to this joyless little community. And eventually he dies and they're now middle-aged spinsters and they have to carry on the mission. However, Here's how the story goes. Without his stern leadership, the sect badly splintered. One brother bore a grudge against another concerning some business matter. Rumors about an old affair involving the two members spread. A pair of old ladies had not spoken to each other for a decade. They still met on the Sabbath and sang the old hymns, but only a handful bothered to attend, and the music had lost its old luster. There was no life there. One night, on a night too rainy for anybody to venture on the muddy streets, the sisters heard a heavy thump on the door. And a young woman collapsed on the threshold. Her name was Babette. She'd had to escape from a war in France because her family was in danger. She had been directed to this little sect and she was a cook. Uh, the sisters had no money to pay Babette, felt dubious about employing a maid in the first place. They distrusted her cooking. Didn't the French eat horses and frogs? But through gestures and pleading, because she didn't speak their language, Babette softened their hearts. She would do any chores in exchange for room and board. For the next 12 years, Babette worked for the sisters. The first time Martine, the daughters were named Martine and, and uh, Philippe for Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon, two great reformers. First time Martine showed her how to split a cod and cook the gruel, Babette's eyebrows shot upward and her nose wrinkled a little, but she never questioned her assignments. She fed the poor people of the town, took over all the housekeeping chores. She even helped with Sabbath services. Everyone had to agree Babette somehow brought new life to that stagnant community. 
Since she never referred to her past life in France, it came as a great surprise to the sisters when one day, after 12 years, she received her first letter. She read it, looked up to see the sisters staring at her, and announced matter-of-factly that a wonderful thing had happened. Every year, a friend in Paris had renewed Babette's number in the French lottery. This year, her ticket had won. 10,000 francs. The sisters congratulated her, but inwardly their hearts sank. They knew this meant she would go back to France, go back to Paris. As it happened, her winning the lottery coincided with the celebration that the sisters were going to have to honor the 100th anniversary of their father's birth. Babette came to them with a request. For 12 years, I've served you for nothing, she said. Now, I have a request. I would like to prepare the meal for the anniversary service. I would like to cook you a real French dinner. What the sisters did not know was that back in the day, Babette had been the head cook chef at the premier luxury restaurant in France. Although the sisters had grave misgivings about this plan, Babette was certainly right. She'd asked no favor in 12 years. What choice they have but to agree. When the money arrived from France, Babette went away to make arrangements for the dinner. Over the next few weeks, the residents were treated to one amazing sight after another as boats docked to unload provisions for her kitchen. They pushed wheelbarrows located with crates of small birds, cases of champagne. Champagne! and wine soon followed. The entire head of a cow, fresh vegetables, truffles, pheasants, ham, strange creatures that lived in the sea, a huge tortoise still alive, moving a snake-like head. All these ended up in the sister's kitchen, now firmly ruled by Babette. Martine and Philippa, alarmed at this apparent witch's brew, explained their predicament to the members of the sect, now old and gray and only 11 in number. Everyone had clucked in sympathy. After some discussion, they agreed to eat the French meal, with only comment about it, lest Babette get the wrong idea. Tongues were meant for praise and thanksgiving, not indulging exotic taste, so they would eat it, but they wouldn't say anything about it. But then they begin to eat, and it is an exquisite meal beyond description, a feast like none of them had ever experienced. Though no one other than one character spoke of the food or drink, gradually the banquet worked its magical effect on the cheerless vi villagers. Their blood warmed. Their tongues loosened. They spoke of the old days when the father, the dean, was alive, and of Christmas, the year the bay froze. The brother who had cheated on another on a business deal finally confessed, and the two women who had feuded found themselves conversing. A woman burped, and the brother next to her said without thinking, Hallelujah! They were healed. They were changed. Philip writes, Babette's feast ends with two scenes. Outside, the old-timers join hands around the fountain and lustily sing the old songs of faith. It is a communion scene. Babette's feast opened the gate, and grace stole in. They felt as if they had indeed had their sins washed white as wool, and in this regained innocent attire, and were gambling like little lambs. The final scene, he says, takes place inside in the wreck of a kitchen piled high with unwashed dishes, greasy pots, shells, grisly bones, broken crates, vegetable trimmings, empty bottles. Babette sits amidst the feast, looking as wasted as the night she arrived 12 years before. Suddenly, the sisters realized that in accordance with their vow, no one has spoken to Babette at the dinner. It was quite a nice dinner, Babette, one of them says tentatively. She seems far away. After a while, she says, I was once a cook at the Café Anglais. We will all remember this evening when you have gone back to Paris, Babette. Babette tells them she will not be going back to Paris. All her friends and relatives there have been killed or imprisoned. And, of course, it would be expensive to return to Paris. But what about the 10,000 francs, the sisters ask? Then Babette drops the bombshell. She has spent her winnings, every last franc of the 10,000 she won, on the feast they have just devoured. Don't be shocked, she tells them. That is what a proper dinner for 12 costs at the Café Inglay. That is the power of sacrifice. 
And then Philip writes, Grace came to them in the form of a feast, Babette's feast, a meal of a lifetime, lavished on those who had in no way earned it. Philip Yancey, just recently in the last month or two, who has written so wonderfully over many decades now, particularly on finding God and pain and then suffering, where is God when it hurts, wrote what I think is the most moving column that he has written and talked about how in his life he has been diagnosed with Parkinson's, does not know what the future holds, but has chosen in this season to make his life and his work a gift of seeking to encourage others, particularly others who are in pain. There is a reason I have thought often, especially during these last years when there has been more pain for me and people that I love, there is a reason why there is a cross at the center of everything. That somehow it is supremely in the gift of sacrifice and especially in the greatest sacrifice in the greatest life of the greatest human being who has ever lived, there is something in the gift of sacrifice, a power and a healing and a forgiving and a transformation that changes everything. God will lead you in whatever way you need to be led in this remarkable, wholly abandoning gift of sacrifice. Welcome home. Hey, I'm Tim. Thanks for joining us here at Become New. We hope that these videos help you to grow spiritually one day at a time. If you want to access our whole library of videos, or if you want to subscribe to the daily emails or text messages that go along with each video, head on over to becomenew.com and you can let us know there. We're also preparing some exclusive leadership content. So if you're interested in that, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash leadership. And lastly, if you've got a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. You can let us know by texting it to 855-888-0444. See you next time.